I'm Chance Storland, and this is In Depth, an interview program from ExpressNews.com with in depth reporting and other resources for stories affecting San Antonio and Bear County. After nearly dying in an intentionally set fire that killed five people in a San Marcos apartment building, one survivor is now adjusting to his new life. And I'm joined now by San Antonio Express News staff writer Peggy O'Hare to discuss her recent exclusive interview with that young man, 20-year-old Zachary Sutterfield, which you can read online now at expressnews.com. So, Peggy, thank you again for joining me here on the In-Depth podcast Let's, of course, start with a brief reminder of the San Marcos fire that police have since declared to have been intentionally set. Hi, thanks for having me. This is probably one of the most haunting and moving stories I have ever covered. Uh, This is a story about a young man who went off to college, and one morning last July, in an instant, his life changed forever. Zachary Sutterfield is 20 years old. He was transferring to Texas State University. He went to San Marcos last summer to get settled, find a job, and to meet with his advisor at the university before fall classes started. He was staying with two friends in their apartment a few blocks from the school. This was at a place called Iconic Village Apartments. It's not student housing, it's privately owned, but many Texas State students live there because it's so close to campus, it's within walking distance. And the apartments have been there for a long time. They were built in 1970. And on the morning of July 20th, 2018, two hours before dawn, while most people at these apartments were asleep, someone deliberately set a fire, and that fire would have tragic and horrific consequences. Five young adults were killed. Five families across Texas lost their children in this fire. And Zachary himself suffered catastrophic injuries. He barely made it out alive. He told us that he woke up as fire was sweeping through the apartment building around 4.30 that morning. He woke up because he was uncomfortably hot, and he noticed colors outside the apartment's living room window, blue and orange colors that were flickering and casting shadows on the walls inside the apartment. He was staying with two friends at their apartment. And these were two of the young victims who died in this fire, Haley Frizzell and David Ortiz, who were both Texas State University students. We learned for the first time when we interviewed Zach recently that he banged on Haley's and David's bedroom doors that morning to wake them up after he became aware of the imminent danger. And the three of them ran out of that apartment together through the front door. They made it outside. Once they got outside, they were surrounded by fire. That's how Zach described it to us. And the three of them diverged in different directions at that point. Haley ran in one direction. David ran in another. And Zach made a decision to jump over the second-story railing outside to escape the fire. But he was very, very badly injured. At some point outside, he caught fire while trying to escape, and he suffered third-degree burns to 68% of his body. These burns were on his head, face, chest, back, arms, hands, and feet. He was wearing a pair of pajama pants at the time, so his legs weren't burned. And when he jumped over that second floor railing outside, at some point during the fall, he suffered a severe head injury. Nobody is really sure how that occurred, but he suffered a traumatic brain injury. 
And from that morning on, there's a big blank space in Zach's memory for about five months. He escaped, he caught fire, then he jumped, then he walked up to an ambulance crew to ask for help. And from that point forward, his next memory was Christmas, five months later. That was the next time when he became aware of his surroundings again. Zach's memories of the fire have just returned in recent weeks. For many months, he wasn't able to recall anything because his injuries were so severe. The traumatic brain injury made it difficult for him to retain information. Even when his parents told him repeatedly he had been hurt in a fire. But in recent weeks, it's all been coming back. He's been able to recall what happened that morning, and what he remembers is pretty harrowing. So, Peggy, this is obviously something very difficult to have been through. Um, you know, anytime with a fire, you think of burn injuries, you think of injuries to lungs, maybe with um, inhaling the smoke. But as you mentioned, Zachary, because of his fall, he had that very traumatic brain injury. So I'm wondering what kind of progress he's been able to make. Um, I, I know he, he's been through, I think, at least 200 days in the hospital going through at least 23 different surgeries. And you mentioned his parents. I know they've really been instrumental in his recovery because simply put, he he just cannot do so many things that he used to most likely all of us, you know, take for granted every day. Sure. Well, he he has made a lot of progress and it's been very impressive. But yes, these these are some of the most severe injuries I've ever observed. Uh, Zachary is being treated here in San Antonio. He's been here since the morning of the fire, and he's being cared for at the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research Burn Center. This is at Joint Base San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston. And this is the Department of Defense's only burn center in the entire country. At this facility, They care for U.S. troops, military service members, along with regular civilians, people like Zach, who have never served in the military. The burn center is highly regarded for the medical care they provide to patients. Zach presented somewhat of a complex case to physicians and caregivers there. Dr. Lee Cancio He's the director of the Army's burn center, and he's also a surgeon. Dr. Cancio told us it's fairly uncommon for a patient to have both widespread burns and severe head trauma. That's the situation Zach came in with. He was brought in by a medical helicopter from San Marcos. Because of the severe head injury, Surgeons immediately had to remove part of Zach's skull to relieve the pressure on his swelling brain. And the surgeons, physicians, and nurses also had to treat the burns covering Zach's body. So it was a challenging case. Zach was hospitalized at the Army's burn center for almost 200 days. He was just released on February 1st. And while he was hospitalized, he underwent 23 surgeries. Most of his fingers had to be amputated because the fire destroyed that tissue. For a while, there was a possibility he might also lose his feet, but that ended up not happening. But even so, Zach had to learn to walk again. His feet were so tender, they would sometimes bleed. He had to learn how to feed himself again. He's learning to put on his clothes without help. Last month, he used a pen to write a note for the first time since the fire. And you can imagine how challenging that is to write a note when you have lost most of your fingers. And this was pretty moving. He wrote a note expressing his love for his mother and calling her his hero. Zach's parents, DJ and Carl Sutterfield, have been at his bedside since the day this fire happened. The family 
lives in San Angelo, about 200 miles away, but they've essentially more or less relocated here to be here around the clock with Zach. Zach is still missing that part of his skull that had to be removed. He'll undergo another surgery, perhaps in March, to replace that part of his skull. Right now, he's going through outpatient physical therapy at the Army's Burn Center five days a week. And these sessions are pretty inspiring to watch. I I watched one of them. It was very moving. Eventually, after he plateaus in an outpatient physical therapy, he'll go to the Center for the Intrepid, which is also located at Fort Sam. And he's making significant progress. He's out of the hospital. And he's living at Fisher House at Joint Base San Antonio with his parents. So he's out of the hospital. His mother estimates they'll be here in San Antonio for many more months, perhaps another year as he continues to recover. Zach is a great young man. After everything he has been through, he still has a very mischievous sense of humor. He's funny. He has a very dry wit. He loves to crack jokes. He's extremely smart. He loves books, poetry, chess, politics. He was very active in speech and debate in high school in San Angelo. His plans before the fire were to get his college degree, become a high school English teacher, Then he was going to go to to law school and get his law degree. He planned to practice law for five years, and then he planned to run for political office. At this point, once Zach has recovered and gets to go home, he would love to pursue his bachelor's degree online, and he would like to become a high school English teacher. But he also described how difficult this recovery, this ordeal has been for him and his family. He talked to us about the first time he saw his face in the mirror after the fire, how he didn't recognize himself. He talked about having survivor's guilt. He talked about second guessing himself, wondering if things would have turned out differently if he'd gone to school somewhere else or lived at a different apartment complex. It was profound and very moving to hear him talk about these things. I also have to say, this is a very close family. Zach's parents are awesome people. They both served in the military. Zach's father is retired from the army. They have literally been at their son's side here in San Antonio throughout his entire recovery. Zach described for us how his parents fed him when he was unable to feed himself, how his mother cooked his meals, bathed him, and took responsibility for his daily wound care. The wound care itself is an enormous task. It takes significant time. It was very moving to me to see how close and supportive Zach and his parents are with each other. How often they tell each other, I love you. How closely and patiently they listen to each other's words without interrupting. How they're still able to laugh and joke with each other. Life is precious to them and they're helping each other through it. There's a real bond there and you can feel it when you're in the room with them. So, Peggy, what you just talked about, obviously a lot of very painful details on how Zachary um, was able to survive the fire. But as you mentioned, you know, how close-knit his family is, a lot of positive details on how that healing has taken place and how that will continue to take place into the future. We're going to talk about what the future holds maybe for Zach and his family here before we finish today's episode. But I want to now move to the latest on the police investigation. As I mentioned, this has since been declared a fire that was intentionally set. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me any updates on what the police are looking into for this fire. 
Well, this is a very serious case. Five young people were killed in this fire. I mentioned Haley Frizzell and David Ortiz, who were in the apartment with Zach. Haley and David died while they were trying to escape that morning. The others who died in the fire were Drew Estes, who was from San Antonio, Belinda Motes, and James Miranda. And they were all young. They were between 19 and 23 years old. Most of them were current or former students at Texas State. So it's very sad and shocking that so many young people were killed in this incident. The San Marcos Fire Marshal's Office and the ATF, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, continue to investigate this fire. They are still trying to determine who intentionally lit this fire and why. Why someone would do that. For right now, it's a mystery. We don't know who did this, and we don't know why. No one has been arrested. Investigators know where this fire was set, and they know how the fire was lit. But they haven't made those details public because they want to protect the integrity of their investigation, which is still ongoing. It's not unusual for investigators to hold some details back from public disclosure like that when a case is still open, especially when no one has been arrested. Also, I'm just a layman here. I'm not a law enforcement investigator, but this looked to me to be a fairly large scene. At the apartment building where the five victims died, the damage was so catastrophic that it looked like a bomb had gone off. The building was literally destroyed from top to bottom, and some parts of the building were no longer standing. And there were 28 apartments in this building. Immediately after the fire, the ATF's national response team sent 50 agents to San Marcos from all over the country to assist with this case. One forensics fire investigator told me 50 agents is an unusually large number. I was also struck by the fact that the apartments of those who died were scattered along all four sides of the building, which speaks to how large this fire was. And we know from interviewing some of the other survivors who got out that this fire moved incredibly fast with great speed. Many of these young people had to jump from second-story windows, and some of them broke bones when they hit the ground. Everyone had very little time to get out. And the fire was so intense that it ultimately spread to two other apartment buildings nearby. So for right now, the investigation continues. Authorities are continuing to receive tips in this case, and they're making progress in solving the mystery of who set this fire. The San Marcos Fire Marshal said just this month that he is confident this case can be solved. And the ATF is offering a reward of up to $10,000 for tips leading to the identification or arrest of whoever ignited the fire at Iconic Village Apartments. Anyone with information can call the tip line at 1-888-ATF-TIPS, T-I-P-S, or they can email atf tips at atf.gov. And so, of course, Peggy, that's just one side of kind of what's left now after this fire. You have the ongoing police investigation that you just mentioned. You know, they're still looking for tips if anyone has them, and there is that monetary reward. But speaking of monetary, several families, including Zach's, are suing the owners and managers of Iconic Village Apartments um, I'd love to have you tell me what they're alleging in that lawsuit. Yes, that's right. Actually, four separate lawsuits were filed after the fire 
against the owners and managers of iconic village apartments, accusing them of safety lapses at the property. And yes, Zachary's parents joined with Haley Frizzell's parents and David Ortiz's parents in one lawsuit. The other lawsuits were filed by the families of the other victims who died and by other survivors who escaped the fire that morning. Those lawsuits were recently consolidated into a single case, and the first hearing is set for March 4th in Austin or Travis County, where the lawsuits were filed. The owners and managers of Iconic Village Apartments have denied any wrongdoing. In court papers, they're saying they didn't do anything wrong, and their attorneys have consistently declined to comment to the media on the allegations raised in the lawsuits. The lawsuits accuse Iconic Village's owners and managers of failing to adequately inspect and test smoke detectors that were installed in the apartments. Some residents told us in the days immediately after the fire that they never heard their smoke detectors go off during the emergency or that these devices sounded off late. Zachary Sutterfield himself told us that he doesn't ever remember hearing a smoke detector go off that morning while he and his friends were running out of the apartment. We know fire investigators have reviewed video footage that revealed some smoke detectors did, in fact, go off. But investigators couldn't say in which apartments those devices were located or when they were activated. The lawsuits also take issue with the fact that Iconic Village didn't have fire sprinklers. Because these apartments were built in 1970, before San Marcos's current fire regulations were adopted, the property wasn't required to be retrofit or equipped with fire sprinklers, unless the buildings underwent significant renovations. The lawsuits also accuse Iconic Village of failing to warn residents of safety hazards at the property. So it remains to be seen how the civil litigation will play out in court. In the meantime, Iconic Village plans to rebuild and will be required to install fire sprinklers in the new apartments, according to the city of San Marcos's current code. One of the owners said they are exploring ways to make the remaining buildings that are still standing safer for the residents living there. Fire extinguishers were installed in each of the apartments several months ago. And then finally, Peggy, as uh, today's episode draws to a close, I want to give you a chance for final thoughts. And then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, returning now to the topic of Zachary Sutterfield, you know, he's been through so much. His parents have been through so much. They've really come together to to help each other get through this uh, time in their lives. What's the outlook like for Zachary? I, you know, he's gone through at least 23 different surgeries, been in the hospital around 200 days um, obviously there's probably a lot more that he has to go through to get to the best place he can be physically after surviving this fire. Well, the director of the Army's Burn Center, Dr. Lee Cancio, told us he is very hopeful and confident in Zach's ability to overcome these challenges. Uh, one of the things in Zach's favor is his age. He's 20 years old, and at the burn center, they treat many wounded warriors, and many of these patients are young, and they're quite resilient, and they can come back from injuries that would be devastating to some. Uh, they can respond very positively, and they can go on to have normal, happy lives. Zach has shown his strength and his resilience in the recovery process he has gone through. Dr. Cancio says the ability of young patients to recover from such devastating injuries really is an interesting and inspiring phenomenon. And his words were, we've seen it over and over again. So I think that bodes very well for Zach. 
we know Zach may likely undergo more surgeries at some point. The scarred skin on the back of his neck is very tight, so he can't lift his head all the way. He still can't fully extend his right arm. He's unable to completely close his eyes. Zach and his medical team are working on all of those issues, but those hardships may require more surgeries. One of the nurses who treated Zach early on at the Army's burn center told us that for a human being to make it through what Zach has been through, it requires someone strong who is willing to do no matter what it takes. I think Zach has shown that he is willing to do no matter what it takes. And he has a strong support system in his family, in his parents, in his medical team. So to me, this is one of the positive stories to come out of this terrible fire. It's a story of hope, perseverance, dedication, and it's really quite inspiring and awesome to watch it, to watch this recovery happening. And a big thank you to San Antonio Express News staff writer Peggy O'Hare for joining me for today's episode of the In-Depth Podcast, an interview program from ExpressNews.com. For the San Antonio Express News, I'm Chance Dorland.